it's going to be on a midterm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true. Why don't you explain it to That looks like the tartaric acid picture curve for. Last time we uh, finished up the identification for the genera, the yeast of the wine, of the wine-related yeasts, and we started in on cell counting. Before we continue with that, uh, do any of you have any questions that you'd like to bring up about the different genera? Now, not the tests themselves, because we'll get to that and how you do that, but just in general about the key use of the key. Yeah. Did you mention or that these botanomyces sometimes can have these real long? The pictures, well, it depends how long. The pictures in Lauder show often, let's say this is about the size of a normal one, let's say with its little point at the side here. Sometimes you can get kind of a flat part, one like that, and something like this shape. I would say, maybe, maybe that's a little bit exaggerated, but something like that. You have to look in Lauder. We'll, we'll try to take Lauder to the, um, labs with us from now on to while we're, while we're working with yeast. Oh, there was a question last time about the use of one of the tests about the uh, uh, nitrate um, assimilation test. Often when you're using bacterial, uh, a test for bacterial identification where their acid is produced, like with lactic acid bacteria and lots of other bacteria produce acids, that you can use a pH indicator to, to detect very small amounts of growth. So instead of looking for uh, turbidity, you could look for um, formation of acid with some bacteria as a nitrate uh, uh, assimilation test. But that doesn't work with the yeast. The yeast don't produce that much acid, generally speaking, so you can't use that kind of a test. You have to use turbidity or cell weight or something like that, or CO2 or ethanol or some other things. But you can't, generally speaking, you can't use acid production. Now, somebody, somebody's going to say, what about Botanomyces? Well, I suppose you could look for acid production in that case because it does produce a lot of acid. Yeah, Stuart. Uh, I remember my question about uh, nitrogen uh, 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 Would uh, ML34 be inhibited by fixed SO2? No, generally not. It would not I don't, did you ask this question before? No. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, not. It's only the free. However, Fornishan found that some lactic acid bacteria could utilize the acid aldehyde part of the addition compound and then free the SO2. So uh, I, don't know how, I don't know really how important that is in a practical point of view. Uh, generally speaking, we talk about free SO2. Um, any other questions? On the reading list that I handed out, as you know, that is for, that's just as a basis you can use for your uh, literature assignment, which is due toward the end of the quarter. Uh, I want to emphasize you don't have to use any one of those uh, uh, reprints. You can use something else if it's wine microbiologically related. If you're in doubt, you might ask me. I might say that that's a pretty prestigious list. It's, it includes, I think, the, the really the backbone of wine, modern wine microbiological information. And once upon a time, we read all that in this class, but it was a little bit uh, too much, I think, to, to really get, uh, we were getting too much information and losing the forest for the trees or the other way around, I think. But I did want to mention one more thing, that if you, if you are good in a foreign language, fluent in a foreign language, and want to tackle another, another uh, article in that language, uh, you're very more than welcome to do that. Yeah. Question on that hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. Have, to like read through that and prepare an outline oh, the one that for the starred one. Yes, I think you should at least prepare a question, um, and you should also prepare the. You should also have in mind at least what you think are the most important parts of it. It's a, and you can bring your notes with you. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a long uh, paper, and there's a lot of information in it. I want you to be really. I don't know if any of you have ever been in the great books discussion groups. Uh, this is where. Uh, this is, I'm, I have been from time to time and am in one right now, and I really think this is a good way to learn something, that you, that you, 
everybody acts as uh, uh, the judge himself and tries to get what he can from the article himself. And then when you've read it that carefully and then you discuss it, you really get a lot out of it. On the hydrometers, we got four people signed up. And so what I have done, I've written a letter to the company to ask them what the price is now, because the last price I had was before this runaway inflation. And when I get that information, then we'll uh, uh, talk turkey, as they say, and I'll collect your checks. OK. Let's start now on cell counting. We said that we mentioned several reasons why it would be important for an enologist to know how to to determine the concentration of cells he might have in some sort of, of medium. Now, a quick way of doing this, remember we had this on one of the handouts, where you could take uh, a loop of a known size, or a loop that you could calibrate it yourself if you wanted to in your own lab. I think it's best as this rather large one that you get more liquid of a hundredth of a milliliter. Put it on a slide, put a cover slip on it, and then calibrate it with your field, your microscope, at different uh, fields, a scanner, the uh, the hydri and the oil immersion, uh, how many organisms you would get for, per field. And this would give you rough estimate. Maybe you'd be off by a factor of two or three, but you wouldn't probably be off by a factor of 10. Um, the, this tells you, and what we're going to talk about as far as cell counting with the counting chambers, this tells you about the total number of cells. It doesn't tell you about the viability. Does anybody know the quick way to determine viability, at least of yeast, approximately? Anybody know this test? Yes. Is that sustainable? Yes, it's not awful. We're going to stain, but we're not. Going, we're going to use a wet mount stain. We're not going to use a dry mount stain. So yes, it's, it's met methylene blue is the answer. You can mix, say, just right on the slide. You mix some of the solution you have with, say, one part to one part of methylene blue, a, a, a certain co uh, composition of methylene blue and alcohol and uh, tartaric acid and the uh, formulas given on one of the handouts. And then what happens? What stains? You know? Which one stains? The dead cells stain. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? And the, and the live cells don't. Why don't the live cells stain? Does anybody know why? Well, there's two points of view. And I'm not sure it's really well been well documented which it is. One is that the live cell is not permeable to the methylene blue. The other is, what happens to methylene blue when it gets in a, to a, to a um, metabolic situation? What's going to happen to it? <laughs> well, more than that, it's going to get uh, reduced, right? Oxidized. <laughs> Which way is it going to be? It's going to, um, <laughs> got me here. <laughs> well, I know the answer. Well, it's going, to, it's going to be reduced, just like oxygen is going to be reduced, yeah. And if it's reduced, it's like in the colorless form. So that's one point of view, that it gets in and is reduced as long as the cell is living. Or the other is that uh, it just doesn't get in. In any case, the live ones don't pick up the stain. Well, this isn't 100% accurate, but it's a good indication. You can get uh, uh, a good idea whether your culture is more or less uh, viable. Now, if we want to do a precise cell count, uh, for uh, rather than the one where you just put the loop on loop full on the slide, we want to use the counting chambers, and there's, I think you're familiar with them. The two important types. One is the Levy Hauser, which is really used for um, red blood cell work, but it's fine for yeast. And the other is the Petrov Hauser, which is often used for bacteria. Now, do you have your handout? that shows the field of the, this one. This is what you see. Let's say that you have, look, you're looking at the chamber with a scanner, the 10 power. That's this whole thing here. And this is, I hope, what you will, what you will see with either chamber. Now, what is it? Does anybody know what the difference between these two chambers is? Yeah. Yeah, that's an important point. One is deeper than the other. This is a, a tenth of a millimeter deep, and this is two hundredths of a millimeter deep. But what you see here is, is what you get <laughs> for, both, uh, for both chambers. Now, the way to use this then is to use a scanner first to be sure you're in the field of view, and then using, the say, the 40 power. Let's talk about the 40 power now with the Levy Hauser. Then you can get this kind of a field here, and you can count this size square with the double lines. Now we have a big square, which is 25 of the 
middle size squares with the, the double lines. And the middle size square, it has 16 of the little squares in it. So little squares, middle size squares, and then the large square. But we want to get the number of, let's talk about yeast now, the number of yeast in the whole field. And so you'd, you'd, you would scan across with this 40 power on all of these. Well, if you had lots of yeast, this may be thousands you're counting, so you don't need to count that many. You might count this field, this field, this field, this field, and this field. You might count five fields. Or if it's really concentrated, you might just count one field. What would be the minimum number, if possible, the minimum number of cells that you'd want to count, would you say, from a statistical point of view? Any idea? 50 is good, but I think 100 is better because you're getting three digits then. So if you can count 100, say you have less than 100, you're not going to be able to count 100, are you? But if you, if you have more than 100, then count at least 100. And, and being smart people as you are, you knowing how many squares you have that you've counted, and knowing that there's, 20, that there's 25 middle-sized squares or 25 times 16 tiny squares, you can calculate how many you would have for the whole uh, field, for this whole big square. And then knowing that size and knowing the depth, then you can calculate the number that you have uh, per milliliter. And I'll tell you what the conversion factor is uh, on the grounds that you have to be able to know where that came from. For, for the uh, Levy Hauser, the whole square, the, the large square, we'll say, you take the number of cells in the large square and multiply it times ten, uh, 2 times 10 to the fourth. And that'll give you the number of cells per milliliter. Now, for the Petroff Hauser, often you're counting a smaller number of squares. And one tiny square, number in a tiny square, or little square, times 10 to the seventh gives you cells per milliliter. Okay? Yeah. Well, you, you calculate and you figure it out. Hmm? Remember, we're talking about, in this one, we're talking about the number in here. Pardon me, no, in the, this one, we're talking about the number in the whole thing. And you multiply that n number, s number cells times 2 times 10 to the 4, and you get the cells per milliliter. For the Levy, for the Petroff Hauser, just taking one of these tiny squares, multiply times 10 to the 7th. And I, you should be able to figure it out. Well, there's the, one mil, the large square is 1 millimeter by 1 millimeter by 10 millimeter deep. So depending, on which, depending on which chamber you're using. The Levy Hauser. Okay, right? So that's 10 to the minus 4 cubic millimeters. Oh, I see. Hmm. <laughs> Let me see. You figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, figure, I'll figure it out then again. Um, it should be right. It should be right. So let me think now. Oh, I think I got it right. Yeah, that's it. This is the way it is, I guess. There, OK. Well, you'll find out. <laughs> that does seem like that would be more correct, though. Um, now, we would like to talk about when we might use one and when we want to use the other. The chamber itself, it's very important that you use the proper cover glass with it. Now, with the Levy Hauser chamber, it's a very thick cover glass and sits on here and you put your liquid in under the side there. Now this means that it's very difficult to use uh, oil immersion that you, because this cover glass is so thick. So uh, you have to use a uh, high power, uh, um, high dry. Well, why not then use a thinner cover glass, a regular cover glass and put on there? Did that solve the problem so you could use oil, so you could use oil immersion? Would that be a good idea? No, it's not because because the surface tension then will pull that slide and bend the slide, and you'll change the, the chamber size. So be sure to use the proper cover glass that comes with it. But the, with the Petroff Hauser, you do you can use oil immersion, and you have a very thin cover glass. And how do you handle that? The cover glass is mounted on a on a support on a plastic support, so that so it can't be pulled down. So the surface tension of the water can't pull it down. So there's one difference right away, that you can use the Petroff Hauser with oil immersion. And I want you to try it once. You have to be very careful, though, 
Because there's two things that can happen. One, you could break the cover slip, which isn't, which is bad enough in itself. You could break the chamber too, which is kind of, they're expensive, they're about 20 bucks or more. So be very careful when you do the uh, oil immersion. Now, we just want you to see what it's like to use the oil immersion. Now, what about phase contrast? Uh, Theoretically, you shouldn't be able to use phase contrast with either one of these because of the thickness of the, of the slide itself. But in fact, if you are careful and if you off-center the condenser, you can get kind of a phase contrast. So this, what I'm saying is that you could use the Levy-Hauser for bacteria if you um, set, if, 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 with some microscopes, you can get some phase contrast. But with using wine material, you know, you have to use phase contrast or you can't really tell the bacteria from a lot of the other junk that's in there. So often you would want to use the Petrov Hauser because you could have a better chance of getting uh, phase contrast because that is a thinner slide. Again, it's not designed for phase contrast. There is a slide that is designed for phase contrast, a very expensive one, that is quite uh, thin where the chamber is, thinner than, than the other one. This is a Levy Hauser, I should say, thinner than, than this one. And you, you can get phase contrast a little bit better. I don't know that it's worth the difference in money, though. It depends on your microscope. So there's uh, uh, two reasons, two different reasons for using one chamber as compared to the other. One is that you can use oil immersion with one. One is you might have a better chance to get uh, phase contrast. There's another reason, though, too, is that you have this uh, large thickness in the chamber for the levy hauser. And if you have yeast in there, well, that's not so bad. The yeast kind of fill up that, well, they don't fill up that space. But you, your, depth of, your depth of focus here is enough that you can see the yeast without uh, running the, uh, the objective up and down a lot. But when you've got this, this amount of liquid in here and you have bacteria in there, unless you wait for the bacteria to settle all down at the bottom, you're going to have to adjust the um, microscope up at the uh, objective up and down to, to focus through all of this to be able to pick out all the bacteria. <clears throat> so there is an advantage in using uh, the uh, Levy-Hauser Levy for yeast and the, the Petrov-Hauser for the bacteria because the Petrov-Hauser is, is thinner. You know, so you don't have so much depth of focus to go through. Is it the Levy-Hauser Levy is a thick one. As the chamber is thick as compared to the Petrov-Hauser. Okay, um, first of all, you, for yeast, it doesn't matter. For yeast, you, they're so big that you can see them. And, um, it, and the other reason for choosing one over the other has to do with the dilution. That if you have uh, a very low number of cells, then if you use the Petrov Hauser, you're not going to really be able to find them very easily. Because you've, you've really spread that out, spread what you have there much thinner. So that's another reason for having the choice between the Petrov Hauser and the Levy, Levy Hauser. If you have a more concentrated solution, you go to the Petrov Hauser. If you have a less concentrated solution, you go to the Levy Hauser. Now you can dilute, of course. If you have too concentrated, you can do it, make a dilution, but it's nice not to have to. You can go just use the Levy Hauser. On the other hand, you can't very well make it. It's not very easy to make a concentration. So if you have low, if you have a, a low level of cells, you would you're almost forced to use the uh, Levy Hauser. So there are these things that you have to decide which one you want to use. You have to, have to decide about the concentration. You have to decide how important it is to have oil immersion and phase contrast. And you have to uh, also take into account that if you're using the Levy Hauser with bacteria, that you're going to have to wait for them to settle down or you're going to have to do a lot of focusing in and out to be able to pick them all up. Now, some other things we should know about this uh, chamber, about what we're going to count. What if we have liners? We have, this is the double square here, double line square. And we have a yeast there. Should we count it or not count it? Yeah, it depends. The, what, what you do is you want to be consistent. Let's say if you count, you count them, all the liners that are at the top and on the left, but don't count any liners that are on the bottom or on the right. Hmm? Yeah, well, yeah. Tie goes to the runner. No, you, uh, uh, if you, no, no, you actually, what you do is make a decision, and if it touches it, if it touches these, you count them. If it touches these, you don't count them. So you would just be consistent. Okay, what if you have um, 
um, budding cells, say yeast, and they're just about ready to divide, would you count that as one or two? It depends what you want. If you're going to compare this as to uh, viable uh, count as, uh, to uh, um, potential colony formers, that would be only counted as one, right? If you're going to spread this out on a plate and count a colony, that would only be counted as one. But if you wanted cell mass, say how much enzyma enzymatic power was present, then you want to count it as two. So you have to keep in mind what you what you want to do, what you're doing it for. How many times you take out the time you get out of your plate that might divide? Yeah, that's true. Well, okay, let's take another case then where you have where you have one that's about that size. That's you know, that's growing. Well, often what you can do in this case, you can if it's if you can estimate that it's over half the size of this, you count it. If it's not over half the size of this, you ignore it. You have to uh, specify this, and you have to know what you know what your kind of answers you're looking for. And the same with bacteria. Now, with uh, looking at stock, often you just have long, long, long chains of cells. And about the best thing you can do is, is count chains rather than count cells. And you might give an estimate that most of the chains you say chains are uh, four to eight cells per chain or something like this. So there are some uh, some uh, um, variables involved in coming to this uh, answer. Well, uh, I, and we'll be doing this in the lab on um, on Tuesday. We. Don't have we? I think we have enough chambers for every group. We have more Petroff Hauser, more uh, Levy Hauser than we do Petroff Hauser. So you'll have to do you have to take turns, and maybe some of you'll start with the Petroff Hauser, and others will start with the Levy chamber. I'm not going to put the phase contrast one in the lab. It's rather expensive, and uh, I don't think you'll get that much out of it because you can, if you have a phase contrast microscope under proper conditions, often you, I should say you can get some phase contrast using the, the Levy chamber. Well, then, as in the other th kind of wa way we could have for uh, estimating the number of cells is do a viable count. And I think you're all pretty familiar with this. What you do is just put, as I uh, mentioned in one of the labs, you just put a tenth of a milliliter of culture onto a plate and spread it out. This is one way of doing it. Spread it out with one of those spreaders, one of those hockey sticks, we call them, made from um, a Pasteur pipette. But now you have to be careful what you're going to put on here. If you just take a fermenting culture of yeast, which is about 10 to the 8th cells per milliliter, then you're going to get 10 to the 7th cells on there, and it's going to be all confluent uh, growth, and you're not going to be able to count any colonies. So you have to do some dilutions. And what the way to do this is dilute, dilute this into sterile water, and usually a 1 to 10 or 1 to 100 dilution. Do them serially, and pretty soon two or three of those, and you're down to a number you can handle. And it's good, I think, to put on, say, 100 to 200 colonies per plate. Again, you want over 100, so you can have three digits to work with. And if you've got much over 200, they get pretty crowded, and it's hard to do a, a count on them. Naturally, you use sterile water for the dilution, or sterile salt solution. And naturally, you use a sterile pipette, and you only use it once. You don't, trans you don't use it over again, because you'll have uh, material clinging to the uh, to the inside of the pipette, which would really throw your numbers off. Uh, yeah, ten to two, one times ten to the eighth to two times ten to the eighth is the usual figure given for yeast uh, cells per milliliter. Budding or not budding? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Usually, well, th none of these methods is extremely accurate. And often, the people like to do three plates from the last dilution tube. Um, I, we'll, do, do, we'll do it in duplicate, at least. To, strictly speaking, you should do the dilutions in duplicate or triplicate also, because you're, that's probably the, your big source of error, is the dilutions themselves. You should know this uh, from 123 and other, another uh, coursework, where you have a concentrated material, say, uh, uh, sugar say in grape juice, and you want to do a sugar analysis, and you, you can have very accurate sugar analyses, but to do the proper dilutions, to get it down low enough so it fits into the, fits into the uh, analysis, is a big source of error, the dilution itself. Yeah. OK. Well, 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 suppose you, like you, you want to see what kind of cell count you have in a, in a 
Oh. Oh. Yeah, this is one one of the things you have to be careful that you're getting a representative amount. If they're clumped together by by um, flocculation, like 505, I don't think there's much you can do about it. You just maybe you're better off doing a cell weight, dry weight, and knowing approximately what the weight of a cell is, you can figure it out. Uh, at any rate, well, the sample you have should be well mixed. If you want an accurate uh, concentration of the amount in that liquid, and you have to mix it well. And if it's Lee's, Lee's yeast, it's very difficult to get them all into solution. I mean, they kind of stick to the bottom. You really have to do some stirring to, to get it. But you wouldn't probably be doing a, a cell count on, on a Lee's, Lee's, Lee's yeast, yeast from Lee's. Oh, I should say, too, that um, when you're doing these dilutions, serial dilutions for this, you must mix them well, too. It's good to have a vortex mixer to mix up the, the, the tube that you've added the yeast to, or the bacteria, before you take another sample out. Um, I suppose all of you have done this in bacteriology, too, anyway, but we're going to do it one more time. Uh, it'd be easy for you if you've had it. If you haven't had it, uh, you'll learn something. Are any questions on, on cell count? Oh, that oh, that's the number, approximate number of yeasts in an actively fermenting grape wine fermentation. That's a maximum. That's a rule of thumb. For a fermentation? Yeah. Normally, we, you think a minimum of about 2%. No, I mean, that's your percent inoculum you add to. Right. I mean, what is the cell count of the inoculum you add well, to? Well, it would be, okay, yeah. then it would be two to four times uh, 10 to the uh, six per milliliter then, wouldn't it? Here, 2% of this, in other words. I, I, oh, I mean, oh, I see what you would... I think yeah. you want a higher concentration of cells in their inoculum. No, you can't get it, oh, you can't get it any higher. That's as high as you can go. No, pardon me. What you want to do is that when you've inoculated, you want the yeast level to, the yeast count to be about 10 to the sixth cells. And to do that, you could add about 2% of, of a starter culture. But you can't get this much higher by, well, the tricks. You can um, add, add more active dry yeast, dry material. Uh, Mr. O did some experiments with uh, active dry yeast using about five times this amount. And boy, the fermentation really went fast. OK, let's see what we're we doing on time. We want to talk just a little bit about um, lab material. Uh, there's no lab, of course, this, this afternoon. Uh, but there will be on Tuesday, and there'll be time to do the chromatography. So I want to uh, give you a schedule for that and a procedure. And this is a, just a simple write-up of the procedure I think you've all done in uh, 123, the chromatography. Now, you read this, uh, you've probably read it before and know the procedure, but I do want you to understand it well, that everything on it except the, the last uh, two paragraphs starting here, I wouldn't consider very important for you down here. But the rest of it, I want you to know the details. And what we're going to have you do is each group will do a chromatography of all the wines of their section each lab period. Need more? That's what's back. See you on the back? Yeah, that's why I passed it out, because it's a pretty picture of me. Um, the schedule will be like this. Um, Every lab period, um, up to the last lab period, of course we won't do it then because we wouldn't, couldn't get the results in time, since it has to go overnight. This will be posted to in the, in the lab. So as a group, 
then for the afternoon, group A will chromatograph all of their nine wines or whatever it is for that section. Now, if you're familiar with this, then just do it. <laughs> but if you're not familiar with it, then, I, then be sure to you learn how, how to do it from beginning to end. You can make up your own solvent. We'll end up with lots of, we don't throw the solvent away, we'll end up with lots of extra solvent, but that's all right, we use it uh, throughout the year. And so uh, this will give me experience in, in making it here. It's just a good place to learn how to do this very well. As I say, if you're really familiar with it, just do the chromatog chromatography. If you're not familiar with it, you should do it and you'll be able to understand everything, all the hints that are in the, um, the reprint. And as if, when your results, if you get any, when the papers have dried, if you find any wines have undergone malolactic fermentation, be sure to let me know and we'll start talking about that right away. The reason I'm saying this is that you may think, if you've never done it, you may think, well, there's nothing to it and there isn't anything to it. But still, in actually doing it yourself, you'll come across some, uh, some little uh, tricks of the trade, I think, that will uh, help you so that if you're on your own, you wouldn't have so many questions about some aspects of it. What we'll do is that I'll help the first group set them, set them up, and then the next time this group will help this group, and then this group will help this group to, to know where everything is and where, uh, where we're going to um, let the chromatograms dry and all that sort of thing. Okay, Nick, also on Tuesday, we're going to, if you're ready, we'll start the yeast identification. That is, we'll have the materials there, but don't start unless your yeasts are, are purified already, because you just might get into some trouble. But we'll have everything ready there. And then, oh, that's the other handout on what that procedure is. And we'll talk about this in lab on Tuesday. And I, I hope you'll have read the uh, handout before the, the uh, session. How to do this. And there will be uh, yeast, known yeast, that'll help you on these tests. And here's a list of those. From the uh, our culture collection. So that's we won't talk, we won't discuss that now. We'll discuss that on Tuesday. Now, it, even though there's no lab this afternoon, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you or your partner were going today or tomorrow and just look to see if you can transfer a culture so that it would be purified by Tuesday and we get a little bit of a head start. There's plenty of time to get this done, the results before the, the results have to be turned in, but it wouldn't be bad to go in. And I just want to, on that note, want to um, say a uh, note of appreciation or congratulations or something. I really think the class is doing really a good job. I was amazed uh, how interested or how interested you were or appeared to be, which is the same thing, last Tuesday in your, in your um, lab period. I had thought, well, I looked at my plates and I saw, well, it looks like there's really only one culture to, to really look at under the microscope today. They probably will have a very quick time in and out because most of the lab will be devoted to doing the BRICS readings and maybe looking at one, one colony under the microscope. But in both sections, you really uh, were showed a lot of great interest in, this, uh, in what you were trying to see. And I was talking with another professor about the class this year, the classes this year as compared to other years. And I don't want to badmouth other years because they've all been good. But it does seem to me, for, one reason, for what reason I don't know, that this, class, this year's group seems to be um, has the edge on some of the others. It's nothing from this side, I know. It's something, I don't know what it is. If we knew, that would be, uh, we'd all be rich if we knew how to pick people this way. Well, enough of that. I did want to say something about the, uh, however, however good you are, I do want to say something about the way you use the microscopes. Please, there's some things you've got to remember. One is handle them with both hands. Don't hold them with one hand. Carry them, put the, if you're moving them, carry them with two hands. Another is when you're through, wipe the oil off the objective, off the um, oil immersion objective, and use lens tissue. This is as good way. There are some, some people that think that ether is better, and some people that think spit's better. But at any rate, the, uh, the uh, uh, lens tissue is, is fine. Uh, don't leave the, objecti the objectives in the contracted position. Leave them in the uh, uncontracted position. And leave the scanner in place. Don't leave it with the um, oil immersion or the high dry in place. Leave it with the scanner in place. Uh, 
and put the cover, the plastic cover back on to keep the dust free. Now, I might just mention something about, there I heard some people talking about dark, dark field and phase contrast and dark phase, and I think there might be some confusion. You, you should know this, and if you don't, you might go back over your bacteriology two notes. But dark field means that the center of the cone, the light coming into the specimen, is blocked out, and you only have the light coming in for the side. And so what you see is, is not, the, not the magnification of the object itself, but you see the, um, glan the light glancing off the object. It's like the Tyndall effect. You know, in a, on a morning, you see the sun shining through where some dust is. You see the dust particles. Well, it means you can see very, very tiny particles that you couldn't see otherwise. But also, when you're see looking at large things like yeast, it means you can see the outline very well. And we don't use this very, very much uh, I mean, in, the, in the course. And I don't use it very much very often upstairs because it's, it's kind of hard to set the thing up. But it is nice for looking at, at the shapes of things sometimes. Um, the other thing is phase contrast. And that's a little bit different situation. And it's really pretty simple. That you have the light coming in from the condenser. There's a ring. And so only light, instead of light coming straight into the specimen, it comes from two sides like this. And if it hits a place that's, where there's no change in index of refraction, it just goes on through, as it should. And then you have another ring up here. And then the, the, uh, the objects are such that you get some sort of image up here. And if there's no change in index of refraction, you don't see anything. If there's a change in index of refraction, the light is deviated over like this. And so instead of going through this plain ring, it goes through this part, which slows down the light a little bit. And so when it gets back up to here, it interferes with this light. And if it's dark phase, not dark field, but if it's dark phase, that means that the interference is negative, and you've canceled out this wavelength with this wavelength. It's a half wavelength behind. So that's what dark phase is. You can also have light phase, where it's such that the wavelengths will um, reinforce each other, so that you'll get um, a bright place instead of a dark place where the index of refraction changes. OK. Any questions on any of that? You knew all that anyhow. OK, let's talk about once you've gotten the genus of uh, your yeast, what genus it is, we want to know what the species is, especially if it's Saccharomyces. Now again, this big snowstorm here are the handouts today. I've taken a, hopefully, a simplified part of Lauder, especially for the wine wine species of Saccharomyces. Now, in her um, key, uh, on one of the pages in the key, and you'll see this in, uh, I guess it's uh, reprint number three, she lists a page like this of all the Saccharomyces species with all their attributes. Uh, sugar fermentations, et cetera. Well, you can see that it's quite an imposing list. Well, this, this is some, and then of course she has a dichotomous key, but it includes lots of, lots of organisms we're not interested in, especially. So this will be a, uh, a shortcut. And it's based mainly on, at least at first, on fermentation of various sugars. And we have the code for what these sugars are is on the back of this last handout. There's uh, glucose is G. Sucrose is S, lactose is uh, L, maltose M A, galactose G A, cellobios C, mellobios M E, raffinose R. And so we list these by first uh, whether they ferment galact galactose, sucrose, or maltose. And we're not really interested, and I've listed them for your information. And if it falls into one of those, then you'd have to go to Lauder and key it out according to her key. But ordinarily, wouldn't be interested in any of these till we get down to these here, which are the wine strains. When I did this, though, uh, we didn't know about Bailey being a spoilage yeast. But I thought, well, maybe I should take that out and make it and keep it separately. But it's quite complicated, and I don't think it's very important. And if you did find a yeast that didn't ferment any of these ye any of these sugars, then you'd go to uh, Lauder and see if it might be Bailey Eye. If you found a Saccharomyces, I should say. Now let's talk a little bit about um, fermentation again. We said that if it ferments, ferments glucose, it'll ferment fructose. Or if it ferments anything, it'll ferment uh, glu glucose and fructose. 
Now let's talk about where we have some, some disaccharides. Well, we could, have, we could say first that galactose is a monosaccharide and it ferments it or it doesn't ferment it. But what about something like maltose, which is, remember what maltose is? It's two glucoses, right? Now, just, be, just because an organism would ferment glucose, would it necessarily ferment maltose? What would it have to be able to do? Yeah, it'd have to be able to break that. What if, what if we had um, lactose, which is a galactose glucose, beta galactose, beta galactose, sorry, a glucose galactose. Now, if that, if that were positive, lactose positive, what would it tell us about fermentation of these single sugars? It would tell you, it would tell you first that it would break it, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, you know that it, if it's fermenting, then it's got to ferment glucose. But whether it ferments lactose or not, you wouldn't know. You'd have to do lactose test to see, to see that. All you know is that it's lactose positive. And if it were lactose negative, what would, it tell you, what would it tell you about glucose or galactose? Nothing. Nothing, right. Okay, what about raffinose? You know what that one is? Got it here? <laughs> um, I got it here in my, in my notes. <laughs> Don't want to get any more of those two, two times 10 to the fourth mix up. Okay, we have galactose. Fructose and glucose. Galactose, glucose, and fructose. And this is a, a handy way to tell us some things. Now, this, what is this sugar here? Glucose and fructose, you know? Sucrose. Sucrose, right. And what's this sugar, do you know? Glucose and galactose? No, it's the other way around. That was, that was, uh, Glucose galactose was, is lactose, but galactose glucose is melobiose. So if, first of all, you'd see if raffinose is fermented or not. If, it's, if it is fermented, then you would have to use these two sugars to be able to tell, and maybe even galactose, to tell what, what the total fermentation is. And actually in the, in the um, scheme, we use raffinose zero fermented, raffinose one third, Raffinose two thirds, or raffinose uh, three thirds, and we have a scheme here on the handout that the key for you. So if you know if raffinose ferments one third, then it's melobios negative, galactose you can't tell. Two thirds melobios positive. That's on this, on here corner. Now I want you to understand how that comes about. This is a nice key, and you can look at that real quickly and find out the answer for this part of the key. But I want you to understand how they derive, how one can derive that that uh, raffinose one third is melobios negative and galactose positive or negative. Is that clear? Okay. From this scheme here, you should be able to tell. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, this is raffinose. And we need to know where the raffinose ferments for the key. We have to know if the raffinose doesn't ferment, or if it's fermented one third, one sugar, or two, two of the sugars, or all three of the sugars. Now, one way you could do this would carry out the fermentation to see if it got bubbling, and then maybe add a, a known yeast that, uh, that ferments sucrose or ferments malobios. So you can see if there's anything left or not. That's one way to do it. Another way is by using malobios and sucrose Galactose, of course, uh, glucose, of course, and galactose. You can, by knowing all what the cell, what the organism does with each one of these sugars, you can predict then which part of the fructose molecule is being fermented. And actually, the answers are here: that if if melobios is positive, galactose negative, then that means that raffinose is fermented two thirds, and that's what you need to know for this scheme. But I want you to tell me, show, be able to know how the, the right side got there from the left side. Uh, I don't understand the last one. Raffinose. Uh, three 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 means all of it. Equals oh. equals 
He goes, no, it's not. It's not Mel Bias. He goes, um, hmm, misprint. <laughs> No, I don't think it's negative. Let's, well, let, let, okay, let's go through it. Maybe that'll help. Um, if it permits all three, if it's melabios positive, then that this this is broken, and it's sucro. What's the other one? Galactose positive. Okay. If it's melabios positive, then this is broken, and it ferments this. This is positive. Yeah. If it permits melabios, then it must be able to break. No. Wait, I'll have what's to. The other, what's the other one besides melabios? It, it doesn't say here. I think there's a mistake. I'm sorry. I'll come back to that uh, Tuesday. Maybe you can figure it out in the meantime. <laughs> uh, God. Bad day. How are we doing on time? How many more? I can get into <laughs> Let's see if I got it here. Um, Well, I don't have it right here. Well, oh, well, let's go. Let's go over the rest of this key, though. What do I do with it? Well, it seems to me it'd have to be positive, but that doesn't seem to me that's enough. It seems to me you'd have to be gloop. If it permits galactose, if it permits well, no, we, no, the point is we don't, we don't know if it ferments all of it. That's the point. Well, we know, no, the period. point, what you're doing is you're trying from this information to decide whether it ferments one-third, two-thirds, or three-thirds. That's the point. You know that it ferments uh, raffinose. You put the raffinose in and something, bubbles come out. But you don't know how much of it's fermented. And so you determine that by these other, th other tests. Well, let's say if galactose is positive, then it must mean that it broke this bond no, no, it doesn't. It, it, no, if, if galactose is positive, it means it will ferment galactose if this is broken. If this is bro, if this is broken, then it must ferment melabios. If melabios, if melabios is fermented, then it would break this bond, right, and ferment this. But it has to be sucrose negative. No. Did you run through the classic differentiation between top and bottom yeast used by the breweries because they use this system? Yeah, that's that's based on this one here, melabios, right here. Whether it breaks this bond or not. This is Carlsberg gensis or Uvarum, Uh negative and. <laughs> put, I know you put raffinose in a test tube and you put the cerevisiae in, and what's left is melabios. Well, you no, know, you can do it, you can do it with melabios itself. Look, let's look on this thing here. Well, that's that's pardon me. That's the the point that melabios used to be so expensive that you had to do it this had to do it this way, uh, and then you had to do it by adding another yeast, a known yeast, to see what was two thirds or not or three thirds. But now with melabios not being so expensive, you can use a much cheaper way to do it. Well, let's go. Maybe this will help if we go through this. Um, the first ones are simple, where the galactose positive, sucrose negative, etc. Till down here we have a galactose negative, sucrose positive maltose positive, then raffinose not fermented. We have two species of yeast here, Ruii and heterogenicus. Now if raffinose is one-third, and how are you going to know if raffinose is one-third? By this scheme down here when we get it corrected. Okay, raffinose is one-third, and then you look for whether galactose is assimilated or not. Galactose positive, galactose negative. If, remember the assimilation test. It doesn't have to ferment galactose. It just has to be able to grow on galactose. And then if it's over here, if it's um, cellulobios positive, then it's this organism, it's cellulobios negative, it's praetoriensis. Galactose assimilated negative, then you, we have another, you have to look at something else. And that's to see what the sporulation uh, picture is of the yeast. And we get two different organisms here, fermentati and uh, bianus. Now if we go on to raffinose two-thirds fermented, we have these two organisms, which you can't pronounce. And now, here we go to another group here where we have galactose, sucrose, and maltose all fermented. Raffinose not fermented, talicus. Raffinose one-third fermented, starch positive or starch negative. We have these two organisms. And then if it are, are, are these two choices, and then if it's cellular bios positive or negative. And again, we have to look at either invaginations of the cell or when the ascus, or when the conjugation occurs. We have two choices here. We get Praetoriensis or our friend Cerevisiae. 
Then we can go on to um, uh, ethylamine, and we have, oh, oh, pardon me. Then we go on to raffinose, um, completely fermented, which means it would be melobios positive. <laughs> okay, that's the answer down here. That's melobios positive for uh, raffinose three, three thirds. Melobios has to be positive because that's the difference between ovarum, Carlsbergensis, and cerevisiae. And then you have a choice then of whether ethanolamine is uh, utilized or not. And you have uh, uvarum or these other three, and then you have to go to uh, Lauder to separate these three out. Okay. Well, time's up, but let's just see. <laughs> if, if, yeah, if melobios is positive, then this, this, will, this will break. If galactose is positive, then this will be fermented. And if, but we still don't know whether it'll break this bond here. So it has to be sucrose too. That's, that has to be sucrose on there too, I think. There's a mistake on that. It's in, it's in Lauder's book too, and we'll, uh, we'll get it for sure next time, okay? Sorry about that. Okay, you're welcome to use the lab. There's some more, more plates and there's more still waters. Uh, that, those cabin, cab cupboards are open, unlocked. If you want to use a microscope, I don't think you need to, but if you want to, you can either come upstairs and use mine, or I can give you the key for the cupboard down there. Or you can go in tomorrow, too. Any extra?